영웅은 슬기 500번 읽기 도전 네, 즐거운 마음으로 시작해 보겠습니다 사실은 시작하기 전에 몇번 시도를 했는데 음, 기억이 감감을 하는 게 있어서 확인하고 다시 녹음한다고 시간이 자꾸 늦어지고 있습니다 음, 영어로 말을 하는 거랑 영어를 외워서 그걸 체화시킨 상태에서 어, 다른 표현을 끄집어내는 거랑은 또 조금 틀린 거는 같습니다 근데 이게 아마도 제가 훈련이 덜 되어서 그렇겠죠 어 왜냐면 이제 저도 여러 가지 다른 사람들이 쓴 영어 공부 방법에 대해서 흉내도 내어 보고 따라도 해보고 어, 많이 해 봤었지만 결국에는 어 많은 기법들이 똑같은 얘기를 하는 것 같습니다 꾸준히 해라 그리고 힘든 시기가 오, 오더라도 이겨내라 그러면 결과가 온다 이건데 음, 방법들이 다들 이제 다양하시죠 뭐 레몬 쌤도 있고 어, 영어 회화 책 한번 외워 봐라 라는 것도 있고 뭐 얼마든지 많은 방법들이 나옵니다 근데 결국 그 책들의 결론들은 제가 해보니까 물론 그분들 만큼 해보지는 못했어요 근데 흉내를 내어 보고 따라 해보면서 느낀 거는 뭐냐면 항상 어느 시점이 되면 되게 어렵더라고요 근데 그거를 어, 중간에 사실 힘들다고 아니면은 에이 내가 왜 이러고 있니 라는 핑계를 대면서 사실 이제 자기 합리화를 시키면서 그 방법들을 이제 포기를 해버리는 경우가 비일비재했습니다 그러면서 지금 내 실력으로도 괜찮은 걸뭐 라는 이제 자기 위안을 많이 했었죠 어 근데 사실은 이제 속으로 느끼는 욕구들이 있습니다 더 잘하고 싶다라는 생각들이 있습니다 음 그래서 이걸 끝까지 이제 이번에는 어, 조금 늦은 나이이기는 하지만 요즘 늦은 나이도 없잖아요 그렇죠? 어, 그래서 끝까지 도전해 볼 생각입니다 여러분들 중에 한 분이라도 저를 끝까지 가라고 응원해 주신다면 어, 제가 진짜 끝까지 가는 데큰 힘이 될것 같습니다 그리고 사실 이제 여러 번 읽으면서 영어를 하는 재미도 사실 느끼고 있어요 조금씩 재미있어지는 걸 느낍니다 음, 뭔가 이게 이해가 조금 더 이해의 폭이 커지는 것 같고 어, 영어라는 것들이 어, 단순히 어, 문장이라기보다는 음, 결국 그네들이 쓰는 얘기잖아 그네들도 이렇게 말하는 거잖아 그리고 그네들이 말하는 방법을 저희가 배우는 거잖아 라고 생각을 하게 되고 어, 그러다 보니까 조금씩 조금씩 재미가 있어지는 것 같습니다 자 오랜만에 이제 서문 같이 한번 외워보고 그런 다음에 챕터 1 들어가 보도록 하겠습니다 음 책은 다들 아시다시피 버니큘라가 되게 어려운 책은 아닙니다 AR 레벨로 치면 4.4 정도 되고 음, <웃음> 애기들 책이죠 애기들 책인데 저에게는 그래도 큰 도전입니다 자이 책이 어렵다 라기 보다는 이런 책을 통으로 한권 500번 읽어 본다는 것 자체가 사실은 굉장히 큰 도전 아니겠습니까? 자, 한번 읽어보도록 하겠습니다. 어, 서문을 외워보도록 하겠습니다. b e n i c u l a Editor's note. The book you are about to read was brought to my attention in a most unusual way. One Friday afternoon, just before closing time, I heard a scratching sound at the front door of my office. When I opened the door, there stood a sad-eyed, droopy-eared dog carrying a large, plain envelope in his mouth. He dropped it at my feet, gave me a soulful glance with a great, quiet dignity sauntered away. Inside the envelope was the manuscript of the book you now hold in your hand. together with this letter. Gentlemen, the enclosed story is true. It happened to me, it happened in this very town to me and the family who, with whom I reside. I have changed it, names of the family in order to protect them. But in all other respects, everything you will read here is factual. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Harold. I come to purely write, purely writing by chance. Uh, 
and I live with I live with Mr. and Mrs. Mono. I live with the family. I live with. Oh shit! <laughs> and I live with the Mr. and Mrs. X. Cold here. Ah, <laughs> uh, 죄송합니다. 어, 이렇게 말로 하는 거하고 진짜 외워서 하는 거하고 너무 차이가 있는 것 같아요. 근데, yeah, I live with a family whom I live with a family. I live with Mr. and Mrs. X called here the Monos. And their two sons, Toby, aged 8. And Pete, aged 10. Uh, also, also sharing our home is a cat named Chester, whom I am pleased to call my friend. We were a typical American family. Uh, and we were a typical American family and Chigumdo <laughs> We were a typical American family and and we are and and Chigumdo Gre of course, right now, yeah. <laughs> ah, still, <laughs> still, we are. Wow, <laughs> Still, we are. Yeah. <laughs> the events related in my story have. Of course, had their effect on our lives. Ah, <laughs> 정말. I, I hope you find out this tale of, this tale of sufficient interest. Uh, I hope you will you, you I hope you find out the sufficient. I hope you find out. This tale of sufficient of interest to yourself and your readers to warrant its publication. Sincerely, Harold X. Yeah, it came with. Oh, 만나 확인 한번 해볼게요. 아 정말. 휴. I leave with the Mr. and Mrs. X called to hear the bonus, and their two sons, and the Chester and. My pleasure to come. We were a typical American family and still are. Yeah, and still are. Though the events related in my story have. Wow, I hope you will find that this tale of sufficient interest. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 그런 것 같습니다. 이것도 뭐 하나의 증상이겠죠. 제가 뭐 이거 편집해서 낸다고 제가 이걸 어 100번 읽은 다음에 한참 쉬었다 읽었을 때 다시 기억나느냐 마느냐 그리고 이걸 체화가 됐기 때문에 말로 끄집어낼 수 있었느냐라는 문제에 대두를 한다면은 제 기준에서는 제가 이제 그렇게 좋은 머리가 아닌 것 같습니다. 제 기준에서는 아니다 아직까지는 아니다라고 얘기할 수 있을 것 같습니다. 물론 이제 외우고 나서 하루 이틀 뒤에는 그게 잘 기억이 났었고 했는데. 음한 며칠 어, 서문을 안 보고 챕터 보면 읽었다고 어 한국말로 어떻게 이야기하는지는 기억이 나는데 아 물론 얘기를 해라면 다른 표현으로도 제가 꺼집어내는데 어 이걸 외운 그대로 꺼집어내려고 하니까 왜 이렇게 헷갈립니까 참 <웃음> 어이가 없습니다 근데 이제 그렇습니다 예 이게 현실이고 이제 그렇습니다 자 서문 다시 한번 해볼까요 또는 서문 다시 하고 챕터 본 들어가 보도록 하겠습니다.
어, 이제 잘해야 되겠죠. <웃음> 자, 물론 이제 앞에 연습했던 게 있기 때문에 지금 하면 잘하겠죠. 어, 기억이 다 살아나는 것 같습니다. 자, 해볼게요. Elter's note. The book you are about to read was brought to my attention in a most unusual way. One Friday afternoon, just before closing time, I heard a scratching sound at the front door of my office. When I opened the door, there stood a sad-eyed, droopy-eared dog, carrying a large, plain envelope in his mouth. He dropped it at my feet, gave me a soulful glance, and with great quiet dignity, sauntered away. Inside, the envelope was the manuscript of the book you now hold in your hand, together with this letter. Gentlemen, the enclosed story is true. Uh, it happened this very town to me and the family with whom I reside. Uh, I have changed the names of the family in order to protect them, but in all other respects, uh, you will read here is factual. Everything you will read here is factual. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Harold. I count purely writing by chance. My full-time occupation is dog. And I live with Mr. and Mrs. X, called here the Munros, and their two sons, Toby, aged 8, Pete, aged 10. Also sharing our house, also sharing our home is, sharing our house is a cat named Chester. A cat named Chester, whom I am pleased to call my friend. We were a typical American family, and still are. Though the events related in my story have, of course, had their effect on our lives. I hope you will find this tale of sufficient. This tale, I hope you will find this tale of sufficient interest to yourself and your readers to warrant its publication. Sincerely, Harold X. <웃음> 오, 이제 기억이 났습니다. 야, 참, 예. 어 그런데 기억을 되살려 주니까 또 금방 이렇게 살아나네요 좋습니다 <웃음> 예, 되게 부끄럽긴 하지만 그래도 예, 또 챕터 1 읽기 들어가 보도록 하겠습니다 챕터 1 The Arrival I shall never forget the first time I laid these now tired old eyes on our visitor I had been left home by the family with the admonition to take care of the house until they returned that's something they always say to me when they go out. Take care of the house, Harold. You are the watchdog. I think it's their way of making up for not taking me with them. As if I wanted to go anyway. You can't lie down at the movies and still see the screen. And the people think you are being implied if you fall asleep and start to snore or sketch yourself in public. No, thank you. I'd rather be stre stretched out on my favorite rug in front of a nice whistling radiator. But I digress. I was talking about that first night, where it was cold, the rain was pelting the windows, the wind was howling, and it felt pretty good to be indoors. I was lying on the rug with my head on my paws, just staring absently at the front door. My friend Chester was called up on the brown velvet armchair. Which years ago he'd stake it out as his own. I saw that once again he'd covered the whole seat with his cat, cat hair, and I chuckled to myself, picturing the scene tomorrow. Next to grasshoppers, there is nothing that frightens Chester more than the, vac more than the vacuum cleaner. In the midst of this reverie, I heard that car pull into the driveway. I didn't even bother to get up and see who it was. I knew it had to be my family, the Monroes, since it was just about time for the movie to be over. After a moment, the front door flew open. There they stood in the doorway, Toby and Pete and Mom and Dad Monroe. There was a flash of lightning, and in its glare, I noticed that Mr. Monroe was carrying a little bundle, a bundle with tiny glistening eyes. 
Pete and Toby bounded into the room, both talking at the top of their lungs. Toby shouted, put him over here, Dad. Take your boots off, you're soaking wet, replied his mother. Somewhat calmly, I thought, under the circumstances. But mom, what about the... First, stop dripping on the carpet. Would somebody like to take this? Asked Mr. Monroe, indicating the bundle with the eyes. I'd like to remove my coat. I will, Pete yelled. No, I will, said Toby. I found him. You will drop him. I will not. You will too. Mom, Pete punched me. I will take him, said Mrs. Monroe. Take up your coat this minute. But she, be but she became so involved in helping the boys out of their coat that she didn't take him at all. My tranquil evening had been destroyed and no one had even said hello to me. I whimpered to remind them that I was there. Harold, cried Toby. Guess what happened to me? And then, all over again, everyone started talking at once. At this point, I feel I must explain something. In our family, everyone treats everyone else with a great respect for his or her intelligence. They go for the animals as well as the people. Everything that happens to them is explained to us. It's never been just a good boy, Harold, or used a little box chatter at our house. Oh no, with us it's, hey Harold, dad got a raise and now we are in a higher tax bracket. Or come sit on the bed, Chester, and watch this Wild Kingdom show. Maybe you will see a relative, which shows just how thoughtful they are. But after all, Mr. Mono is a college professor and Mrs. Mono is a lawyer. lawyer. So we think of it as a rather special household. And we are, therefore, rather special pets. So, it was at all surprising to me that they took the time to explain the strange circumstances surrounding the arrival of the little bundle with the glistening eyes now among us. It seems that they had arrived at the theater late, and rather than trip over the feet of the audience already seated, they decided to sit in the last row, which was empty. They tiptoed in and sat down very quietly, so they wouldn't disturb anyone. Suddenly, Toby, who's the little one, sprang up from his chair and squealed that he had sat on something. Mr. Morton told him to stop making a fuss and move to another seat. But in an unusual display of independence, Toby said he wanted to see just what it was he, said he had sat on. An usher came over to their row to shush them and Mr. Mordo borrowed his flashlight. What they found on Toby's chair was the little blanket bundle that was now sitting on Mr. Mordo's lap. They now unwrapped the blanket and there in the center was a tiny black and white rabbit sitting in a shoebox filled with the dirt. A piece of paper had been tied to his neck with a ribbon. There were words on the paper, but the Mordo's were unable to decipher them because they were in a totally unfamiliar language, I moved closer for a better look. Now, most people might call me a mongrel, but I have some pretty pants, pretty fancy bloodlines running through these veins, and the Russian Wolfhound happens to be one of them, because my family got around a lot. I was able to recognize the language as an obscure dialect of the Carpathian Mountain region. Roughly translated, it read, Take good care of my baby. But I couldn't tell if it was a note from a believed mother or a piece of a Romanian street music. The little guy was shivering from fear and cold. It was decided that Mr. Morna and the boys would make a house for him out of an old crate and some heavy duty wire mesh from the garage. For the night, the boys would make a bed for him in the shoebox. Toby and Pete ran outside to find the crate, and Mrs. Morton went to the kitchen to get him some milk and the lettuce. Mr. Morton sat down a dazed expression in his eyes, as if he were wondering, as if he were wondering how he came to be sitting in his own living room, 
in a red raincoat with a strange bunny on his lap. I signaled to Chester, and the two of us casually moved over to a corner of the room. We looked at each other. Well, what do you think? I asked. I don't think rabbits like milk, he answered. Chester and I were unable to continue our conversation because a deafening crash commanded our attention. Pete yelled from the hallway, Ma, Toby broke the rabbit's house. I didn't, I just dropped it. Pete won't to let me carry it. It's too big, Toby's too little. I'm not. You're too. Okay, fellas, Mrs. Murna called out as she entered with the milk and lettuce. Let's try to get it in here with as little hysteria as possible, please. Chester turned to me and said under his breath, That lettuce looks really perceived. But if there is any milk left, I get it. I certainly wasn't going to argue with him. I'm a worryman myself. At that moment, the crate arrived, barely standing the stain of being pulled in two directions at once. Oh my god! 죄송합니다. 어, 지금, 어, 우리 큰딸이 사준 정말 맛있는 밀크티가 있는데 제가 너무 흥분해서 이걸 쏟아버렸어요. 예, 조금 이따가 치워야 될것 같습니다. 아, 정말 맛있는 건데. 예. 아, 너무 아깝네요. 예, 제가 소개시켜 드리려고 했는데. 아깝습니다. 음, 그래도 너무 맛있네요. 음. Ma Toby says he's gonna, uh, he's gonna keep the rabbit in his room. That's not fair. Harold sleeps in his room. Only sometimes, I thought. But I know he's got a leftover ham sandwich in his drawer. Toby's a nice kid. Don't get me wrong. But it, but it doesn't hurt that he shared with his stash with me. It was, after all, at one of those late night parties in Toby's room that I first developed my taste for chocolate cake. And Toby, nothing, uh, noting my preference, has kept me in chocolate cake ever since. Pete, on the other hand, doesn't believe in sharing. And the only time I tried to sleep on his bed, <clears throat> he rolled over on me and pinned me by my ears so that I couldn't move for the rest of the night. I had a crick in my neck for days. But he's mine, Toby said. I found him. You sat on him. You mean? You sat on him. You mean? I found him. And he's sleeping in my room. You can keep smelly old Harold in your room and Chester too, if you want to. But I'm gonna keep the rabbit in mine. Smelly old Harold? I would have bitten his ankle, but I knew he hadn't changed his socks for a week. Smelly, indeed. Mr. Morneau spoke up. I think the best place for the rabbit is right here, in the living room, on that table by the window. It's light there, and he will get lots of fresh air. Peter's taller than I am, Toby cried. He will be able to see the rabbit better. Too bad, Squirt. Okay, said Mrs. Murnau through clenched the teeth. Let's bring him to bed and make him comfortable. And then we can all get some sleep. Why? Pete asked. I don't want to go to sleep. Mrs. Murnau smiled a little too sweetly at Pete. Look, Ma, said Toby. He's not drinking his milk. Chester ducked me in the ribs. Didn't I tell you? He asked. Excuse me while I make myself available. Hey, said Toby. We gotta name him. Can that wait until tomorrow? asked Mr. Morneau. The boys shouted in unison. No, he has to have a name right now. I have to say I agree with them. It took them three days to name me, and those, <clears throat> those were the three most anxious days of my life. I couldn't sleep at all, worrying that they were really going to call me Fluffy, as Mrs. Morneau had suggested. Well, all right, sighed Mrs. Murna. What about, uh, say, Bonbon? Uh oh, there she goes again. I thought, where did she get them? Yuck, we all said. Well, then, how about Fluffy? She offered hopefully. 
Peter looked at his mother and smiled. You never give up, do you, Ma? Meanwhile, Chester, who had also been named Fluffy for a short time, was rubbing against Mrs. Monroe's ankles and purring loudly. No, Chester, not now, she said, pushing him aside. He wants to help us name him, don't you, Chester? Toby asked. As he scooped him up into his, his arms, Chester showed me a look. I could tell this was not what he had in mind. Come on, Harold, Toby called. You've got to help with the name too. I joined the family and the serious thinking began. We all peeled into the box. It was the first time I had really seen him. So this is a rabbit, I thought. He sort of looks like a Chester, only he's got longer ears and a shorter, a shorter tail and a motor in his nose. Well, said Pete, after a moment, since we found him at the movie, why don't you call him Mr. Johnson? There was a moment of silence. Who's Mr. Johnson? asked Toby. The guy who owned the movie theater. Pete answered. No one seemed to like the idea. How about the prince? said Mr. Murnau. Dad, said Toby, are you kidding? Well, I had a dog named the prince once, he replied lamely. Prince, I thought, that's a silly name, that's a silly name for a dog. We found him at a Dracula movie. Let's call him Dracula, Toby said. That's a stupid name, said Pete. No, it's not, and anyway, I found him, so I should get to name him. Mom, you're not gonna let him name him, right, are you? That's a favoritism, and I'll be traumatized if you do. Mrs. Myrna looked in wonder at Pete. Please, Mom, please, Dad, let's name him Dracula, cried Toby. Please, 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 and with each please, he squeezed the chattel a little harder. Mrs. Mono picked up the bowl of milk and moved toward the kitchen. Chester followed her every movement with his eyes, which now seemed to be popping out of his head. When she reached the kitchen door, she turned back and said, Let's not have any more argument. We will compromise. He's a bunny, and we found him at a Dracula movie, so we will call him Bunny Killa. Bunny Killa. That should make everybody happy, including me. What about me, butter the cheddar? I won't be happy until she puts down the milk. Well, guys, is that okay with you? She asked. Toby and Peter looked at one another, and then at the rabbit. A smile grew on Toby's face. Yeah, ma, I think that's not, that name is just right. Pete shrugged. It's okay, but I get to feed him. Okay, I'm gonna put the milk bag in the fridge. Maybe he will drink it tomorrow. What about Chester? Toby said, dropping the, dropping the frantic cat to the floor. Maybe he would like it. Chester made a beeline for Mrs. Murnau and looked up her, looked up at her plaintively. Oh, Chester doesn't want any more milk, do you, Chester? You've already had your milk today. She reached it down, patted Chester on his head, and walked into the kitchen. Chester didn't move. Okay, bedtime, said Mr. Murnau. Good night, Bunnicula, Toby said. Good night, Count Bunnicula, Peter said sarcastically, in what I took to be his attempt at a Transylvanian accent. I may be wrong. But I thought I saw a flicker of movement from the cage. Good night, Harold. Good night, Chester. I licked the Toby. Good night. Good night, Smelly Harold. Good night, dumb Chester. I drilled on Peter's foot. Mom, Harold drilled on my foot. Good night, Pete, Mrs. Murnau said with great finality as she came back into the living room. And then more calmly. Good night, Harold. Good night, Chester. Mr. and Mrs. Monroe went up the stairs together. You know, dear, Mr. Monroe said, that was very clever. But Nicola, I could never have thought of a name like that. Oh, I don't know, Robert. She smiled as she put her uh, put her uh, put her arm through his. I think Prince is a lovely name too. The room was quiet. Chester was still sitting by the closed the kitchen door in a state of shock. Slowly, he turned it to me. I wish they had named him Fluffy, was all he said. Yeah. <웃음> 자, 한번 읽었고요. 
어, 22번 어제, 근데 어제 행각까지 해서 22번 이제 23번째 들어갑니다 어, 조금 읽는 게 처음보다는 많이 자연스러워지지 않았나요? 저도 이제 굉장히 자연스럽게 하려고 애를 쓰고 있습니다 <웃음> 자 읽어보도록 하겠습니다 음. Chapter 1 The Arrival I shall never forget the first time I laid these now tired old eyes on our visitor. I had been left at home by the family with the admonition to, to take care of the house until they returned. That's something they always say to me when they go out. Take care of the house, Harold. You are the watchdog. I think it's their way of making up for not taking me with them. As if I wanted to go anyway. You can't lie down at the movies and the see the screen, and the people think you are being implied if you fall asleep and start to snore or sketch yourself in public. No, thank you. I'd rather be stretched out on my favorite rug in front of a nice, whistling radiator. But I digress. I was talking about that first night. Well, it was cold, the rain was packing the windows, the wind was howling, and it felt pretty good to be indoors. I was lying on the rug with my head on my paws, just staring absently at the front door. My friend Chester was curled up on the brown velvet armchair, which years ago he'd staked out as his own. I saw that once again he'd covered the whole seat with his cat hair, and I chuckled to myself, picturing the scene tomorrow next to grasshoppers. There is nothing that frightens Chester more than the vacuum cleaner. In the midst of this reverie, I heard the car pull into, pull into the driveway. I didn't even bother to get up and see who it was. I knew it had to be my family. The mourners, since it was just about time for the movies to be over. After a moment, after a moment the front door flew, flew open. There they stood in the doorway. Toby and Pete and Mom and Dad were known there was a flash of lightning, and in its glare, I noticed that Mr. Mono was carrying a little bundle, a bundle with tiny glistening eyes. Pete and Toby bounded into the room, both talking at the top of their lungs. Toby shouted, Put him over here, Dad! Take your boots off, you are soaking wet, replied his mother, somewhat calmly, I thought, under the circumstances. But Mom, what about... First, stop dripping on the carpet. Would somebody like to take this? Asked Mr. Murnau, indicating the bundle with the eyes. I'd like to remove my coat. I will, Pete yelled. No, I will, said Toby. I found him. You will drop him. I will not. You will too. Mom, Pete punched me. I will take him, said Mrs. Murnau. Take up your coat this minute. But she became so involved in helping the boys out of their coat that she didn't take him at all. My tranquil evening had been destroyed, and no one had even said hello to me. I whimpered to, I whimpered to remind them that I was there. Harold cried to Toby, "Guess what happened to me?" And then, all over again, everyone started talking at once. At this point, I feel I must explain something in our family. Everyone treats everyone else with greater respect for his or her intelligence. That goes for the animals as well as the people. Everything that happens to them is explained to us. It's never been just a good boy, Harold, or used a little box chatter at our house. Oh no, with us it's a hey, Harold. Dad got raised and now we are in a higher tax bracket. Or come sit on the bed, chatter, and watch this Wild Kingdom show. Maybe you will see a relative, which showed you just how thoughtful they are. But after all, Mr. Murnau is a college professor and Mrs. Murnau is a lawyer, so we think of it as a rather special household and we are their first rather special pet. So it wasn't at all surprising to me that they took the time to explain the strange circumstances surrounding the arrival of the little bundle with the glistening eyes now among us. It seems that they had arrived at the theater late and rather than trip over the feet of the audience already seated, they decided to sit in the last row which was empty. They tiptoed in and sat down very quietly so they wouldn't disturb anyone. Suddenly, Toby, who's the little one, sprang up from his chair and squealed that he had sat on something. Mr. Murna told him to stop making a fuss and move to another seat. But in an unusual display of independence, 
Toby said he wanted to see just what it was he had set on. He had set on. An usher came over to their road to shush them, and Mr. Murnu borrowed his flashlight. Uh, what they found on Toby's chair was the little blanket bundle that was now sitting on Mr. Murnu's lap. They now unwrapped the blanket, and there in the center was a tiny black and white rabbit sitting in a shoebox filled with dirt. A piece of paper had been tied to his neck with a ribbon. There were words on the paper, but the mourners were unable to decipher them because they were in a totally unfamiliar language. I moved closer for a better look. Now, most people might call me a mongrel. But I have some pretty vengeful bloodline running through these veins, and the Russian wolfhound happens to be one of them. Because my family got around a lot, I was able to recognize the language as an obscure dialect of the Carpathian mountain region. Roughly translated, it read, Take good care of my baby. But I couldn't tell if it was a note from a believed mother or a piece of Romanian shit music. The little guy was shivering from fear and cold. It was decided that Mr. Murnu and the boys would make a house for him out of an old crate and some heavy, dirty, some heavy duty wire mesh from the garage. For the night, the boys would make a bed for him in the shoebox. Toby and Pete ran outside to find the crate, and Mrs. Murnu went to the kitchen to get him some milk and letters. Mr. Murnu sat down a dazed expression in his eyes as if he were wondering how he came to be sitting in his own living room in a wet raincoat with a strange bunny on his lap. I signaled to Chester and two of us casually moved over to a corner of the room. We looked at each other. Well, what do you think? I asked. I don't think rabbits like milk, he answered. Chester and I were unable to continue our conversation because a deafening crash commanded our, our attention. Pete yelled from the hallway, Ma, Toby broke the rabbit's house. I didn't, I just dropped it. Pete won't let me carry it. It's too big. Toby's too little. I'm not, you're too. Okay, fellas, Mrs. Mona called out as she entered with the milk and letters. Let's try to get it in here with as little hysteria as possible. Chester turned to me and said under, under his breath, That letter looks repulsive, but if there's any milk left, I get it. I certainly wasn't going to argue with him. I'm a waterman myself. At that moment, the crate arrived, barely standing the strain of being pulled in two directions at once. Ma, Toby says he's going to keep the rabbit in his room. That's not fair, Harold sleeps in his room. Only sometimes, I thought. But I know he's got a leftover ham sandwich in his drawer. Toby's a nice kid, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't hurt that he shared his stash with me. It was, after all, at one of those late night parties in Toby's room that I first developed my taste of taste for chocolate cake. And Toby, noting my preference, has kept me in chocolate cake ever since. Pete, on the other hand, doesn't believe in sharing. And the only time I tried to sleep on his bed, he rolled over on me and pinned me by my ears uh, so that I couldn't move for the rest of the night. I had a creak in my neck for days. But he's mine, Toby said. I found him. You sat on him, you mean. I found him, and he's sleeping in my room. You can keep smelly old Harold in your room, and Chester too, if you want to, but I'm gonna keep the rabbit in mine. Smelly old Harold, I would have bitten his ankle, but I knew he hadn't changed his socks for a week. Smelly, indeed. Mr. Mono spoke up. I think the best place for the rabbit is right here in the living room on that table by the window. It's a light there, and he will get lots of fresh air. Peter's taller than I am, Toby said. He will be able to see the rabbit better. Too bad, squirt. Okay, said Mrs. Mono, Drew clenched the tip. Let's put him to bed and make him comfortable, and then we can all get some sleep. 
Why? Pete asked. I don't want to go to sleep. Mrs. Mr. Murnau, Mrs. Murnau smiled a little too sweetly at Pete. Look, Ma said. Toby, he's not drinking his milk. Chester nudged me, nudged me in the ribs. Didn't I tell you? He asked. Excuse me while I make myself available. Hey, said Toby. We gotta name him. Can that I wait until tomorrow? Asked Mr. Murnau. The boys shouted in unison. No, he has to have a name right now. I have to say I agreed with them. It took them three days to name me, and these, those were the three most anxious days of my life. I couldn't sleep at all, worrying that they were really gonna call me Fluffy, as Mrs. Murnau had suggested. Well, all right, sighed Mrs. Murnau. What about, I'll uh, say, Bum Bum? Uh oh, there she goes again, I thought. Where does she get them? Yuck, we all said. Well, then how about Fluffy? She offered, hopefully. Pete looked at his mother and smiled. You never give up, do you, Ma? Meanwhile, Chatter, who had also been named Fluffy for a short time, was rubbing against Mrs. Murnau's ankles and purring loudly. No, Chatter, not now, she said, pushing him aside. He wants to help us name him, don't you, Chatter? Toby asked as he scooped him up as he scooped him up into his arms. Chatter shall me a look. I could tell this was not what he had in mind. Come on, Harold, Toby called. You've got to help with the name too. I joined the family and the serious thinking began. We all peeled into the box. It was the first time I had really seen him. So this is a rabbit. I thought he sort of looks like a chatter. Only he's got longer ears and a short tail and a motor in his nose. Well, said Pete, after a moment, since we found him at the movies, why don't we call him Mr. Johnson? There was a moment of silence. Who's Mr. Johnson? asked Toby. The guy who owns the movie theater. Pete answered. No one seemed to like the idea. How about Prince? said Mr. Monroe. Dad, said Toby. Are you kidding? Well, I had a dog named Prince once, he replied lamely. Prince, I thought, that's a silly name for a dog. We found him at a Dracula movie. Let's call him Dracula, Toby said. That's a stupid name, said Pete. No, it's not. And anyway, I found him, so I should get to name him. Mom, you are not going to let him name him, are you? That's a favoritism, and I'll be traumatized if you do. Mrs. Murnau looked in wonder at Pete. Please, Mom, please, Dad, let's name him Dracula, cried Toby. Please, please, please. And with each please, he squeezed the chatter a little harder. Mrs. Murnau picked up the bowl of milk and moved toward the kitchen. Chatter followed her every movement with his eyes, which now seemed to be popping out of his head. When she reached the kitchen door, she turned back and said, Let's not have any more argument. We will compromise. He's a bunny, and we found him at a Dracula movie, so we will call him Bunny Kula. Bunny Kula. This should make everybody happy. Including me. What about me? Muttered the chatter. I wouldn't have I wouldn't be happy until she puts down that milk. Well guys, is that okay with you? She asked. Toby and Pete looked at one another and then at the at the rabbit. A smile grew on Toby's face. Yeah Ma, I think the name is just right. Pete shrugged. It's okay, but I get to feed him. Okay, I'm gonna put the milk bag in the fridge. Maybe he will drink it tomorrow. What about Chester? Toby said, dropping the frantic cat to the floor. Maybe he would like it. Chester made a beeline for Mrs. Murnau and looked up at her, plaintively. Oh, Chester doesn't want any more milk, do you, Chester? You've already had your milk today. She reached down, patted the Chester on his head, and walked into the kitchen. Chester didn't move. Okay, bedtime, said Mr. Murnau. Good night, Bunnicula, Toby said. Good night, Count Bunnicula, Pete said sarcastically, in what I took to be his attempt at a Transylvanian accent. I may be wrong, but I thought I saw a flicker of movement from the cage. Good night, Harold, good night, Chatter. I licked the Toby good night. Good night, Smelly Harold, good night, dumb Chatter. I drooled on Peter's foot. Mom, Harold drooled on my foot. Good night, Pete. 
Mrs. Murnu said with great finality as she came back into the living room, and then more calmly, Good night, Harold, good night, Chatter. Victor and Mrs. Murnu went up the stairs together. You know, dear, Mr. Murnu said, that was very clever. But Nicola, I could never have thought of a name like that. Oh, I don't know, Robert. She smiled as she put her arm through his. I think Prince is a lovely name, too. The room was quiet. Chatter was still sitting by the closed kitchen door in a state of shock. Slowly, he turned to me. I wish they had named. I wish they had named him Fluffy. Was all he said. 스물세 번째까지 읽었습니다. 자 오늘은 여기까지 하도록 하겠습니다.